Hey, what's up guys? My name is Thomas. I'm the author of the project file and in collaboration with Seven Styles, we are proud to announce Sandstorm Motion Kit. Now the number one best-selling Photoshop Sandstorm action is animated and we've created two workflows for you to choose from. You can either begin in Photoshop using the Sandstorm Photoshop action and then export part of your design into After Effects and in After Effects, you're going to be completing and customizing your results or you can work directly in After Effects without even touching Photoshop. So that's great for visual effects and motion graphic artists who don't want to use Photoshop. They just want to do all their work within After Effects. And the really cool part about this is that there are no plugins at all. Up to this point, you typically needed uh, a particular plugin in order to make this work. But now with our workflow, we've created a method that you don't have to have any plugins in order to create awesome uh, dust and particle results based on a specific area that you brush on. So let's look at some examples using the Sandstorm motion kit. If I hit play on here, you can see that what we're going to be doing is brushing a specific area. The results here are that there's particles and dust and a bunch of different things being created from the specific area that you choose. So we have the exact colors, everything then looking really nice. So users who are going to be using the After Effects workflow of not using Photoshop at all, you can skip ahead right now to uh, the fourth part, installing the motion kit. And for users who want to use the Photoshop workflow, we're going to go in the next tutorial into installing the Photoshop action. Within Photoshop, the first thing we want to do is go to Window, Actions, and that'll load the Actions UI panel somewhere within your Photoshop uh, panel on the right-hand side, typically. And then the Action icon is this Play button right here. And we're going to click that, and on the very top right, we're going to go to Load Actions. Click on that, and then you're going to find from uh, your download on Video Hive where your Sandstorm Motion Kit folder is. And then within there, we're going to go to Photoshop Action, and then select your version of Photoshop that you're using and then click on that and hit open. And that'll load in all the different directions to run for the Sandstorm Photoshop action. So we have the action installed now. The next step is to bring a photo into Photoshop. So you either hit Command I or import your photo, however you want to get it in. And then it's recommended to use a photo between 3000 to 5000 pixels in a dimensions by seven styles. And you can use smaller or larger, but it's just best practices to use a photo within that size. Now, the first thing we want to check is to make sure that the image is in eight bits per channel mode. So what I'm going to do is go to image mode and then make sure that that's checked on 8 bits per channel in RGB color. The next thing we want to do is we want to create a new layer. So we'll go to the bottom right in the Layers panel, and I'll create a new layer via this icon right here for New Layer. And we have to rename it Brush. And it has to be in all lowercase. It has to be named Brush. No spaces, no nothing. The action will not work if it's not spelled and look exactly like this right now. We have the layer highlighted for brush. Now I'm going to hit B for the hotkey, or you can go over to the side and select this icon, the brush icon. And I'm going to hit right bracket and make it larger. And if I right click, you can also make it larger right there. And I'm going to go to the color swatches right here. And I'm going to go to the front one and change it to something that's more bright, like a red color. So we can clearly see what we're working with. Now, the opacity I have set at 100%, so I'll start drawing on where I want the particle area to be affected by, something like that. Now we have the area that we want. I can also go in and change the brush opacity to something like 50%, or I can hit 5 on the keyboard for the hotkey, and you can brush other areas, and that will affect the results. Now, one thing I want to say right up front about the best practices for brushing in After Effects or Photoshop is it's best I'll undo this to not make really harsh straight lines. You want things to be a, a little bit organic. So something like that is not best. What is best is to do something like this, where it's kind of random. It's kind of wiggly, and uh, it just does a better job of grabbing pixels and, uh, and looking more organic for the pixels on there. All right, so we have our photo. We have our area brushed, we're ready to go. One last step we want to make sure we do is change the opacity up to 100%. And then we'll bring our actions panel up if you had it minimized. And then we choose which direction we want the particles to go. Do we want it to go left, right, up, down, or from the middle? Now for this example, it probably makes the most sense to go to the right. So we'll highlight the right layer, and then we'll hit play on the bottom. And the Sandstorm action will do its thing. And I'll fast forward to when it's done, and you'll see the results. 
So this is the results that I got. Now the cool thing is you can go up to the very top and twirl up these layers and you can do a bunch of different things in Photoshop. You can uh, change the different colors, presets that 7styles has set up for you. You can adjust the sharpening. You can even delete this and just kind of start over if you want. Turn the brush layer back on, maybe change the brush area to, uh, to something that has more of the neck in or whatever. You can completely customize it. It doesn't really take that long to just try out a bunch of different techniques. So this is as far as I'm going to go in this video regarding the Photoshop side of things because up to this point you basically have all the information you need in order to get results that you can bring into After Effects. Now before we go to the next tutorial, I just want to mention one thing really quick. And that is that what you're seeing right now, the results, when we bring them into After Effects are not going to be identical to what you're looking at. And the reason is because we're kind of recreating a lot of the same layers in After Effects in order to animate them. And the reason I'm telling you this is I don't want you to get too carried away in editing and fine tuning all the different results here and then importing them into After Effects later and wondering why things look different. The, the way we've set this up uh, is with speed, efficiency, and the best results in mind. And in order to get the best results, um, we had to recreate some layers in After Effects. Now there are some elements that Photoshop does a little bit better that we want to pull those layers out and bring them into After Effects. And specifically, the brush layer. So if you're not familiar with, with After Effects or, or, or how to use the brush tool in After Effects, you can do that step in here and then import your results into After Effects and everything's pretty much ready for you to go to customize. Um, but as far as uh, the look goes, I want you to just note that I don't want you to customize it too much in here. Just get the brush, get the basic layout of what you kind of want it to look like, and then proceed with exporting it out. All right, so let's continue on to the next section where we're going to be going over exporting uh, from Photoshop. And now we are ready to export our layers from Photoshop into After Effects. So the first thing we want to do is we want to crop our design. And this is an important step because it has to be in HD. It has to be at 1920 pixels by 1080 pixels. Um, otherwise, it just will not work. So what we're going to do is we're going to crop it by hitting C on our keyboard for the hotkey. Or you can click this uh, crop button right there. And then we're, it's going to have on the top bar the W by H by resolution. That should be from the drop down selected. And then we're going to put in 1920 pix, 1080 pix, 72 by 72 pixels per inch. Make sure this is in pix by inch, not pixels by centimeter. So everything looks good. And then we have a, make sure you can scale this down or however you want it to look. And then we'll hit the checkbox. And then that'll do its thing with cropping all the different layers within Photoshop. So now if I hit Command-1 to go full screen, you can see we still have a large image we're working with. It just is not as large as the original was that we were working with. So now the next step is to go to the Actions panel. And then the top right, Menu. And now we're going to be loading in the Sandstorm exporter. So we'll go to Load Actions and then find our download again. And then go to the Sandstorm exporter.atn file and click Open. Now we'll twirl that down and We'll go to run this action that start. Don't worry about any of these layers below here. It's just this layer that we're concerned about. So we'll highlight that layer and then we'll go to the play button on the bottom. And then that is going to uh, do a bunch of things in the background. Um, and then it's going to have a screen prompting uh, for just a bunch of things. And we can just click over this because I'll just go over it really quick with you. What we want to do is we want to make a new folder somewhere. I'll start on my desktop for right now. So we'll hit Command N or new folder right here and we'll name this layer. Um, headphones and we'll hit open so that's going to save our layers into that folder and that's just to keep things organized I highly recommend putting them into a folder rather than just putting all these layers on your desktop and then we want to make sure that uh, visible layers only is checked file type I recommend PNG uh, it has to have transparency though so it has to be either a PSD uh, a TIFF or a PNG 24 I don't recommend um, you can do PSDs. It doesn't really matter. I've had some issues with PSDs in After Effects that I just don't ever do that anymore. I always use PNG24. So that's best practice for this. And then make sure that transparency is checked. And these two are not checked. So it should look exactly like my screen right now. And then we'll click Run. And then it'll do its thing. It'll export the layers that we're working with. And the main layers that we're going to be exporting, I'll just go through this really quick with you. The main layers that we're going to be exporting, if I go into this folder, are the brush layer. So this step is already taken care of for you when you go into After Effects. And then it has these motion wave layers. And um, I just think it does a little bit better job 
in Photoshop than After Effects with creating these motion wave layers. So those are the ones I'm bringing in. So we're really not bringing in a lot of layers. Like I said in the last section, we're gonna be recreating most of it in After Effects, but this does save you a little bit of time if you're more comfortable in working in Photoshop. All right, so we are all ready to dig into After Effects. Now installing the After Effects file is really simple. All we have to do is go to our download and within our Sandstorm Motion Kit folder, there's a, a Sandstorm AE install file and it's a sandstorm.jsx bin file. So what we have to do with our JSX bin file is insert that into the script UI panels. Now to locate that, find your version of After Effects. Under Mac, it's, uh, it's on Applications and under PC, it believes under Programs. And then within your version of After Effects, go to the Scripts folder. And within the Scripts folder, go to Script UI Panels. And then from there, we're gonna be dragging and dropping that file, that JSX bin file, into that folder. And that's really all there is to installing the script. It's really simple. But let's open up After Effects now. And within After Effects, what I want you to do is go to your Preferences. So After Effects CC Preferences General. And then within our Preferences folder, make sure that Allow Scripts to Write Files and Access Network is checked. If it's not checked, you're going to have to check it and then restart After Effects because it won't take effect until restart. Okay, so that's good to go. Now all we have to do is go to Window and from the drop down, go to sandstorm.jsx bin. And that is everything to installing the Sandstorm Motion Kit. All right, guys, we are ready to start animating. But before we begin, I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page with our After Effects user interface. And then I'm gonna give an overview of how the kit works. And we're gonna go into more detail in the following sections. But uh, for this one, let's just go quickly over everything. So the first thing I wanna note with this is that you wanna dock your panel, so the Sandstorm Motion Kit. Uh, well, actually, first, let's make sure that all of our uh, panels look the same. So I'm gonna close this out. And on the top, you wanna make sure that you're on standard. And then if it still doesn't look the exact same as what mine does right now, uh, go to the menu bar and reset to saved layout. And that will should uh, get it pretty close to exactly what you're seeing right now. Next, I want you to go to Window and then Sandstorm, and that'll import the script. And then we're gonna click on where it says Sandstorm in the top left and drag, and that'll allow you to dock it. And I want you to dock it on the effects and presets. So it's right there, so we can see everything really easily. And then the last thing I wanna do for the user interface is go to Window, Effect Controls, and that docks it by default on the project panel, but I don't want it there. So we're gonna click Effect Controls, click, drag, and drop it so it's beside the Composition panel. So now everything is laid out exactly how I want it so that you can see everything as clearly as possible. The first thing I wanna note with this Sandstorm Motion Kit is that we have these three dropdowns. We have the After Effects dropdown with uh, the exact same as what we saw in the Photoshop side of things with the different directions. Same goes for the Photoshop dropdown. And then we have the Text dropdown. Uh, for the text, I'm gonna go over that in the very last video, but for right now, just note that the Photoshop dropdown, that's for users who are bringing layers into After Effects from Photoshop. And then the After Effects dropdown, that's for users who are using just After Effects exclusively. They're not using Photoshop at all. So let's continue on now in the overview of uh, with the headphone example that I had before. So this kind of pertains to uh, the Photoshop users, but after Effects users should definitely pay attention to all of this stuff in this tutorial because it applies to you as well. So I'll drop down the Photoshop and then I'll go to write because that's the direction that we had before. And the first thing that's gonna come up is a prompt. It asks, please name the folder. So we'll do headphones and this is just to keep things organized. The next thing is please enter the composition name. So this is the main name of the file. I just recommend naming it the same thing as what uh, you had for the project name. So we'll do headphones again. And then finally, it's gonna prompt you, where is that image sequence, those layers that you exported out from Photoshop? So I saved mine to the desktop. We go to headphones and then on the very top layer. Now this is very important. You wanna make sure that you select the first layer in the sequence, not the last, not any other one, but the very first one, and then click open because we're actually importing this as an image sequence, not as an individual image. So we'll click open. And now After Effects will do its thing. Uh, behind the scenes, it's doing a lot of things and setting up everything for you. The first thing I want to note with this is that there's this error that came up. Hopefully they get it fixed soon. So if you're not seeing this, awesome. Hopefully they have it fixed by now. If not though, there's a very simple workaround to getting it to go away. All you have to do is undo and redo. So on a Mac, Command Z, uh, on a PC, Control Z, and then redo, Command Shift Z, or on a PC, uh, Control Shift Z. You can also go to the top bar and go to Edit, Undo Loop, We'll just undo all the stuff we just imported and then edit redo loop. 
So now it basically imported everything back into After Effects that we just did. So the project is basically set up right now exactly um, how it should be without having to do that step. So I apologize about that. Hopefully Adobe gets that fixed soon, but if not, it's not that big of a deal. And especially with the undo redo, that takes literally two seconds with the hotkeys to, to fix that right away. So now let's continue on. We have the headphones layer and we'll twirl these two down. And you can see that first off, there's nothing in the solids layer. So you can delete that right away. You don't need that layer in there. And then we have these edit, render, other, or Photoshop layers folders. Let's twirl down the edit layers. And you can see that we have step one, step two, headphones, which is the composition that we named when those prompts came up, and then some optional elements. I'm gonna go over these optional elements in the second to the last section, the advanced options. But we'll twirl that back up. We have the render elements. So when you're finally done with everything, we're gonna render out uh, one of these two compositions. And then we have other. So this is behind the scenes stuff that uh, you shouldn't have to worry about in the project. And then we have the Photoshop layers, that image sequence that we imported. Let's begin now in step one, insert source. And you'll notice that our source is already inserted. So this step is already done for you. We'll go to step two, brush the selection. And you'll notice that this is already done for you as well because we did this step in Photoshop. So this is that time saving stuff I was telling you about that you don't really have to worry about step one or two. If you're using the Photoshop workflow, you can go directly to step three, which is to work on your main layer, the headphones layer that we named. So we'll double click into that layer and you'll notice right away that the composition doesn't look any different. It looks the exact same. And that's because our current time indicator is on frame zero. Now, how the, the main project is set up from, you'll see that we have this loop start, loop end markers right there. So if we scrub the current time indicator, the particles would start to animate on and they would be fully on on loop start. And then it would create a loop from the this marker to this marker that we could infinitely loop back and forth. So that five seconds could be back to back to back to back and you wouldn't be able to tell where the seam is between the video. And then finally, uh, after this guide layer, the particles will animate away. So if you want uh, the animation to look like that, that's what we're gonna be doing in this render composition when we render that out, is just this exact thing that we're seeing. Now you'll notice that if I bring the current time indicator over and we let it render for just a second. And uh, as a note, I like to work on full resolution. I don't think that the, the wait time is that bad for the particles on this, So, but you can work on half resolution as well. The other thing I wanna note too is that this doesn't look like what you saw in Photoshop, and that's okay. It will look much better with very little work. We kinda went back and forth on um, how we wanted to set this up and we wanted maximum customization for this. So because of having maximum customization uh, out of the box, you don't get as good of results, but trust me on this, you'll have awesome results in just a little bit. I'm gonna go over in just a minute, but we have these presets set up for you that you can just click on check boxes and get it to look how you want it. So let's continue down in the timeline. We have the controller panel, and this has all the main elements for the project. And in the next section, I'm gonna go over all the different elements for the controller and presets, but just know for right now that everything that controls all the particles and everything come from these layers. Basically, I created a wish list of like everything I would want to be able to customize, animate, to get things to look how I wanted. And I came up with all these options that are set up uh, and rigged for you. So you can customize any of these at any time. You can go in and increase them or decrease them. But I know that that would be daunting. So I created another section, which is these presets. So I'll click into here and hit Command A and twirl them up. Now within these presets, uh, we have eight different sections. And these are the main sections that you can use to create significantly different results just from clicking on checkboxes. So let me show you, for example, what I mean by you can significantly change the results. I can tell from this image right away that there's too much contrast. And well, one thing it has kind of going against it right now is it, I, we didn't brush an area that has a lot of color. It's pretty black and white, which is fine. We'll fix that with the color options. But for right now, I can just tell you that the contrast is too high between the density and the particles. So what we're gonna do is go to contrast uh, from the dropdown and every single one of these has the checkbox in the middle, which is kind of one of the reasons why it doesn't look great out of the box. So let's go to the contrast and we'll change the contrast from balanced to very low. So we'll uncheck balanced and check very low. And you can see that 
already we have significantly better results. Another one that's really fun is this particle glow layer. So if you click on this one, it'll change the particles so that they're glowing. I really like using that one. I've used it in a bunch of different examples, but we'll uh, we'll leave it on there for right now. But let's continue on with the layers in here. Uh, another thing I want to note is that it says source name right now. I want you to click on that so it says layer name. That's just a toggle. And what it does is it allows you to add notes or names on layers and composition. So make sure that says layer name on the top. And then we have the camera. And this is the main camera that we're going to be working with. And I'm not going to get too into detail on this, but I just want to note with the camera that you can customize all these different settings within here. So I'll drop these down and you can subtly animate the camera in the loop, which is really cool. But if you don't want it to wiggle at all, you can select a zero on all these and it will have zero wiggle whatsoever on it. It'll just be a completely static image. So I'll undo that. Now the next thing to go over is this color correction layer. And this has the same options that Seven Styles has in his action. You'll notice that this doesn't quite look the same. And the reason why it doesn't look the same is because we're missing the color options. So the next step that I want you to do after you've imported your results is I want you to import the color options. And it's within the assets folder in your download. So I'll hit Command I to import our options, find where your download is, go to Sandstorm Motion Kit, and then Assets, and then Color Options. And then that will import a folder that has the color options. And then from there, we just click, drag, and drop that in between the dividers. That's why I have those two set up, so you make sure to put the, the color option between the dividers. And then finally, we'll go to the Collapse Transform layer, and then click that, and then our color option will be right there. And if you're not seeing the Collapse Transform, icon just on the very very bottom left corner there's that button you want to make sure that's selected so now we have the exact same color options in after effects as what we had uh, before in photoshop which is really cool uh, that you can go in and just go ahead and customize this and try out different options so that is how we're going to insert the color options into after effects and finally within here we have this mask layer now what this allows you to do is if you hit g which brings up the pen tool. And for Photoshop users, I know that seems kind of weird, but that's the hotkey for the pen tool. And then if I go around this, you can see that I can actually mask out where the particles are, which gives you a lot of power. If I select the mask again and hit MM quickly to bring up the mask options, and I bring up the feathering to something like 300, so it's really soft. You can see that we can uh, much more easily go in and fine tune, I'll add a point there and bring that in. So we can kind of customize our results and, uh, and get more detail and organicness if we want into our results. So that's kind of cool as well. So that's how you would mask out the effects. And the last thing I want to go over with you quick is the shy layers. So if you see this button right here, this shy layers, I have that enabled and by default, um, so now we have a lot more layers visible and you don't have to worry about any of these layers. Um, it's a lot of stuff in the background to make the, the project work, but there are a couple I want you to note. One is that there's a second camera in here and the second camera we're going to be using in the advanced options. And then we have some more options for parallax or position controller or scale. And you really shouldn't have to touch any of these, but just note that they are there um, in case you have any questions or, or want to do anything specific. And I message you that Shy Layers is enabled and there's a few more things you can customize if you want to within there. All right, so let's say that we're done. We have our results looking exactly how we want them to. So then the last thing we're gonna do is go to our layer that we're working with and then go to render. And within render, we have the in loop out. So this has the exact same as what we saw before. However, there's one difference. We have sharpening added to the final render compositions. If we want to turn this down, how we do that is we're gonna double click into this final layer. So we'll double click into there. And then it has a add sharpening. And on this, it has a note, adjust opacity to reduce sharpening. So to do that, we're gonna hit T, and then we're gonna bring the opacity down to like maybe 50%, and that'll reduce that sharpening by half. And it does help to add sharpening to particles. It's just a little trick to make them stand out a little bit more and make them look less saturated. So that's, if you want that, cool. If you don't, you can definitely turn that down. And let's say that we wanted it to loop rather than have the animation in and then the, the five seconds and loop out. You can just double click into this loop layer, and within here, you can just render this one out. Go to composition and then add to render queue and then put your presets or settings that you want in and hit render and you're ready to go. With this, it'll give you a five second loop that you can use for social media or whatever and you can set it up as a GIF if you want in Photoshop and you can loop that over and over again, which is pretty amazing for particles and turbulence and 
camera movements and everything that it has a perfect loop. In the next video, we're gonna go over how to edit the brush in After Effects. And for Photoshop users, I would take note of this next section because although you can use the Photoshop workflow, I recommend giving the After Effects workflow a try. It's really simple. It's very similar with the brushing technique as what you're used to. So it's really not that different. And, uh, and maybe it'll make your workflow go a little bit faster without having to go into Photoshop first and work exclusively in After Effects. In this section, we're gonna go over how to use the brush tool. So we're gonna be working with the After Effects workflow. And don't be intimidated if you're not used to using the brush tool. A lot of people don't use it. It's not a very common tool to use in After Effects compared to Photoshop. So let's begin by uh, in the After Effects dropdown, going to write and double clicking on that, we'll name the folder name headphones and the composition headphones. And we'll select our layer that we work with. I'll do the headphone. And then we'll let it do its thing for a minute. And it is done. Now the error came up, so I'm going to hit Command Z and then Shift Command Z and it'll re-import everything really quick. And then I'm going to do the drop down for headphones and then go to edit and step one, insert source. Now within here, what we're going to be doing is adjusting the layout of our composition. So we're going to go to our layer and select it and you can either hit S and scale it up and down. You can hit R and rotate it around if you'd like and you can hit P and adjust the X and Y position. You could also, if you wanted to, just uh, select the layer and then directly move it around as well for the position. So I'll undo that and then I'll hit S for scale and I'll scale that down so it fits within there. Zoom it up a little bit. So right about there. And then we'll go to step two, brush selection. The first thing I want you to do when you go to step two brush selection is make sure your current time indicator is on frame zero. If it's not on frame zero and you begin brushing, that's where the brush will begin. And we don't want that. We want the brush to be uh, affecting the entire duration of this composition. So make sure the, the current time indicator is on frame zero. Now to select the brush tool, what we're going to do is hit command B on a Mac or control B on a PC. And then this icon right here will light up. And you could additionally have just hit this icon if you wanted to as well. I want you to make Make sure though that when you hit command B that you have selected the brush tool because if you hit command B again it toggles between the clone stamp tool and the eraser tool. Uh, I screwed up on this one quite a few times because I thought I was selecting the pen tool and the the same panels come up like the brush and the paint panels come up but um, it does completely different things so just make sure that you have the brush tool select. Now if you're not familiar with After Effects I just briefly want to mention that when you have the brush tool selected it acts a little different when you double click on a composition. Typically, when you double click on a composition, it goes into that composition. And a composition is kind of like a folder where you can have elements within that folder and then you can have folders within folders. And compositions work just a little bit different, but not much. So normally when you double click on a composition, uh, it goes into that composition. But when you have the brush tool selected, it allows you to directly edit that layer. So we'll double click on it now with our brush tool selected, and it will bring up a new panel on here. It says layer, brush this layer. So now we're working directly on the composition rather than within the composition. And that may trip people up. So if that confuses you, uh, just watch that part again. But basically, rather than going into the composition, and I'll show you an example of that right now. So I'll go back and I'll select the selection tool and I'll double click into brush this layer. That'll bring you into this background layer. And we don't want to be in this layer. We want to be working directly on the brush selection step two layer. So again, I'll hit Command B for the hotkey, making sure that it's on the brush tool, and I'll double click onto the layer, and now we're directly able to edit the composition. And it should have these two panels coming up then. It should have a brushes panel and a paint panel. But if you aren't seeing them, go to Window, Brushes, and then window paint. And that'll allow you to bring up those panels manually if they don't come up automatically. Now for the settings within the brushes and the paint, I recommend having the angle at 0%, the roundness at 100%, and the spacing checked and at 25%. The diameter and the hardness are just like in Photoshop where you can control. The diameter is if you bring this way up, it'll allow you to uh, increase the size of the brush and the hardness is the feathering basically of the brush. And I wouldn't recommend having the hardness too high because otherwise you start to get hard edges and we don't don't want hard edges and I have some presets that allow you to soften the edges but it's just best practice to stick under 80 to 90 percent. 
And for the brush dynamics, I recommend having the size and all the different options within there on off. You don't want any of those on. Within the paint panel, I recommend having the opacity set at 100%, the flow at 100%, the mode on normal, the channels on alpha, and it's probably not on alpha by default. So it's probably on RGBA. So you want to, on the drop down, change that to alpha and then the duration to constant. Now you'll notice that the background and foreground change to black and white, and that's what we want it on. So don't worry about that. We want it on black and white. And then finally, what we're gonna do is if you look on the bottom left panel in this area right down here, you'll notice that there's these three icons, these three figures, and one's in black and white, one's pink with a blue background, and one's red with a yellow icon. We wanna click on the red one with the yellow icon, and then change that value right beside it from 50% to 100%. And this will allow you to draw red on the layer, making it look just like what we did in the Photoshop example. And then the last thing I'm gonna do before I start brushing is I'm gonna make sure that my brush diameter is the right size. So you can manually go in and change this amount that way and get it the size you want. But there's this really cool feature in After Effects that I actually prefer over Photoshop of changing the brush size because typically you'd hit the left bracket and right bracket to change the brush size. But in After Effects, you hold Command on a Mac, Control on a PC, and hold that in and then left click, drag, up or down to change the brush size. That's a really awesome, fast way of changing the brush size. So then I'll go in and maybe that's too much. So I'll undo that Command Z. I'll hold Option, drag it down, make it smaller. And if you remember from earlier, I recommend to make these more organic shapes, to not have them be rigid lines. So something more organic like that will look really nice. Now. All we have to do is just go to our headphones layer and then bring the current time indicator to where the, the guide layer says loop start. And now we can see that we have basically the exact same results as when we imported the Photoshop layers. Now, the thing I really like about using After Effects is how quickly you can just go in and edit the brush that you had. And you can still brush the layer within Photoshop, but you can't delete the brush. You can't um, take parts of the brush out like you can with a all After Effects version. So I'll double click on this brush layer again, making sure that uh, the brush is selected. And let's say we don't want this top part in. So what you're going to do to deselect an area is change this paint area, swap it so that the white is in the foreground. And now we can brush areas out that we don't want. So the hotkey for that is X. So you can really quickly add areas in and take areas out. So we'll go back and see our results. I'll just double click on headphones and we'll let it update. All right, you guys, so that's how to use the brush tool. In this section, I'm gonna go over how to customize your results using the presets I have set up for you, as well as go in detail with all the different controller elements that you can adjust in here. So I'll go back to step two for just a second, and you can see that I added back in this top bar. So I'll go back to headphones, and you can see that these are the results right out of the box. And again, not great, but we know we're gonna be able to fix them. So let's jump in first to the presets, and I'm gonna select them, and then hit Command A to select all of them, and then twirl them all up. The first thing I want to say is that the distance that the particles travel and the gap fill, these two correlate with each other. If you have these results too far away, you're going to get gaps within the results that we don't want. So I'll show you an example. Let's change it from standard to long and we'll let it update. And whenever it's updating, I'm going to I'm gonna edit these parts so that you have as little wait time as possible. Even though there is a little bit of waiting that is going to have to happen for all the particles and all the elements that are happening in the background, I'm going to cut all those parts so it looks like it's all instantly happening. But don't think that your computer is slow because it's taking a little bit to, to update, especially if you're using full playback resolution. So you can see that with long, it's still looking pretty good, but let's change it from long to very long. You can see that there's maybe a gap in here that we don't want. So what we can do is adjust the gap fill to be higher or potentially lower depending on the image that we're working with. Higher doesn't always mean better. So now we can see that it kind of extended the entire duration of it and this may be too much or maybe what you want. So we'll go back to standard and we'll go and uncheck. And just in case you do have multiple ones checked of the same category, it defaults to the top one. So if you have like these two selected right now, it'll default to small rather than standard. So now we're back to where we were. The blend helps to overall blend the results. You can turn that up or down if you think it looks better. The spread, if you change the spread, if we turn that from none to very wide, you can see that now, instead of going straight across, it spreads out, which is kind of a cool effect. So we'll turn that back off. The fall off, that affects 
the gradualness of the particles going from fully on to off. So you can adjust that as well. The cloud size, you can see in here that there's kind of like these density clouds that are forming and you can adjust the size of them. So that's one very common one that I edited a lot. And for that matter, I edited all of these a lot when I was working with the demo and all the different images. And how I came up with these presets were I just created a whole bunch of images and then I collected the data from what the highest to the lowest values that I used were. And that's how I created these different presets. The contrast, like we went over earlier, if we change that from uh, balanced to very low, you can see that now the harshness will be removed quite a bit. And then we'll go down to the detail. So we can turn that up from average to very sharp. And then we get a lot more of the detail within the clouds and, uh, and sharp elements happening within there. And then the lightness is the overall lightness of all the particles or darkness of all the particles. And then we have a particle glow, which I went over before. But if you click on that, it changes a bunch of the particles and elements to glow. And then we have the source blend boost. And what this does, if we click it, is you can see that this source right here gets a little bit softer. So the particles kind of come on easier that way rather than a hard edge where the particles start. You can also lower the dust opacity. So you can see in here, if you watch, that it lowered the dust just a little bit and the density opacity. And the density and the dust are similar but different. It, we need all these different effects though to create the final result and illusion that you're seeing. So we'll turn that down again. So that kind of lightened up the whole effect overall. So those are the main presets that you're gonna be working with. I will say that um, as a tip to work with these two together, sometimes if you want the distance extended, you might not necessarily uh, want to adjust the distance. You might wanna extend the gap fill first and then adjust the distance. It just depends on the area that you brush and the, the actual source that you're adjusting. And don't ever forget that sometimes if you want the distance and the gap fill and you're not quite getting it how you want, go back to the brush selection and maybe re work the areas that you have selected or, or deselected because that makes a really big difference overall in the picture rather than just relying on the presets. So go back into here and now I'm going to go over the controller. If at any time you want to change the direction that the different particles go, you can go into here and you can see that when you uh, click on them that you can change it from right to left or whatever. So we can do that right now. I'll show you what it looks like. So we can see now that all the particles are going the other direction, which is really cool that you can on the fly change the direction. And the one that I used a lot to see what it looked like was the middle one. But all of these uh, kind of work together with this particle position. So I'm going to click on this and show you what I mean. If you click on the particle position, you can see that this little dot comes up. But if you're not seeing that, you have to hit Command Shift H because uh, everything may be hidden. And you can see that if we move this around, it thinks for a second. You can see that blue bar coming up. It's doing a bunch of stuff in the background um, and all the particles and different elements are based off of where this particle position is. Now I've created this guide for you to kind of understand what's happening. So if you want, you can enable this guide and it will show you, okay, here's where the particle is right here, these green bars, that kind of visually shows you the spread. So this one right here, and we'll go back to the presets for a second, and I'll change the spread from none to very wide. And you can see then, then this may help some people to visually understand what's happening with the particles. So we can see that the green bars spread apart and the particles spread apart. And we'll go back. And additionally, if you change the distance from standard to something like long, you can see that this red bar indicates the distance, how far away the particles go from the actual source, that dot in the middle there. And if we change from standard to long, you can see that this red bar shifts over. And this is just showing you how far away the particles are. And you can't even see it right now. So maybe we'll go the other direction instead of uh, long will go short so it'll go in closer and then we can start to see that the effect is shorter now and this may be what you want you may want a short and wide effect so we'll undo that and we'll go back to the controller so most of the stuff within this divider section is related to the distance and the gap and there's a bunch of stuff you can edit manually on here you can edit the offset you can edit the uh, overall blend of the effects. You can edit the gap fill width and height because it does kind of change based on if you're going left and right or up and down. And then the swap gap fills. If you're not liking the results of the gap on the presets in the gap fill, try going to the controller and changing the gap fill and switch them around. 
um, because by default, it's set to be horizontal. So if you're using a vertical image, you probably want to check this box. And then there's this gap displacement, so it kind of uh, twists and turns the area to, to make it look more organic if you're kind of seeing shapes within here of the area that you brush that you don't want to be seeing. Now the next section is really fun. It's all relating to the particles. So you can go in and you can adjust the amount of particles in the project. You can adjust the size of the particles, the size uh, when they form and when they go away based on the birth and death size. You can adjust the particle contrast so you can make more contrast or less contrast. You can adjust the turbulence, uh, the glow of the particles. That's uh, that checkbox from the presets, you remember, where I had the glow checkbox. You can adjust the particle amount. All these are pretty much self-explanatory, the particle blur. You may want to turn the large particle blur up because sometimes you can start to see that they're making squares and you might like that, you might not. If you don't like that, you can always change the large particle size and the large particle blur. And then we have uh, all the features relating to the dust. So you can individually affect the dust, individually affect the density. Again, they're similar but different. The density more so acts as clouds within it, whereas the dust kind of acts like formations made from the object. And then we have the motion wave, and that kind of uh, is a, a gradual gradation of pixels from the source over to the particles, making it so it's not such a harsh edge. And then we have this random seed button. And this is really cool. You can change this random seed value at any time and it will kind of completely change the results that you have. It'll change where all the particles are at. It'll change everything. So maybe if you like the results, you just want to see what it would look like a little bit shifted, try that out. And then the displacement amount and displacement size, you can change, you can adjust the overall turbulence of the effect. I don't really recommend editing this unless you're an advanced user because you, you can start to make it look computer generated pretty fast by adjusting the displacement too much. So the settings I have are good. If you want to mess with it, I wouldn't go much higher than 50 on the amount and much higher than 100 on the size. And then one last thing I want to go over in this section before we go to the next section is that if you're using the middle, if you're using this checkbox right here, that the particle position you will almost definitely have to move around because you may want the middle to be over here or over here, for example. And by moving this particle position, it will significantly impact the results of the expansion. So that's one huge advantage compared to the Photoshop side where no matter what, middle meant from the direct middle. Now the middle can mean from any direction. It's more so an outward direction rather than a middle direction if that makes sense. So that's one thing to keep in mind is that definitely check out the particle position when you're using the middle. And finally, with the presets, you want to, when you're using the middle, have it on very long almost every time. Like the, the way the middle one is set up is quite a bit different than the other directions. So the very long is recommended and even probably very high for the gap fill if you want those as long as possible. And if they're not as long as what you would want, if you want them even longer than the very long setting, you can absolutely go back to the controller and then go to the distance and then uh, increase that beyond what the preset is. You'll probably have to adjust the blending as well because you'll start to get gaps, but um, all these ones will work together and you'll be able to get the results you want and the distance you want. All right, you guys, so that is everything for the presets. I hope you enjoy playing with them. I know I did and making them was, it took a while, let's put it that way, but I think that the results now and the customization that you can do with this is incredible. In this section, we're going to go over the advanced options that I have available for you. And they're not too difficult. If you've never used After Effects before, they shouldn't be too hard to get a grasp on. But I do want to go over them right now at the end quick. Uh, in the optional elements, I have two things I want to go over with you. The Add Particles optional or the Faux Depth of Field. Let's go to the Add Particles first. What this allows you to do if you go into here, and by default, if you have the this toggle transparency uh, enabled, you want to disable it, then you can see easier what's going on. If you want to add colors and elements into the particles that are not in the main scene, so for example, if I wanted there to be a green element within these headphones, what I would do is I would hit G for the pen tool and without having any layers highlighted, so if this is highlighted, it'll create a mask tool. We don't want that. We want no layers highlighted, so select down here at the bottom somewhere and then just create a shape doesn't really matter, something organic, and we'll change the color to something like that, okay? Now I'd recommend uh, going to your effects panel, so I don't have that up right now, uh, effect and presets right here, and then we'll go and type in fast for fast blur, and I'll add that into the effect controls panel when the shape layer is highlighted, and we'll turn up the blurriness so it's not so harsh, 
And now if we go back to the headphones layer, you can see that after this updates, that after it renders, we'll have green within there. There, and now you can see that this may be a little bit too extreme, but you can see how we can add green within our design when it's not even on the main source layer. So I'll go back to the add particles and maybe we'll make this smaller and make it like that. And then we'll change the color so it's not quite so bright. So there's just a little bit of green in there. And now we'll go back to the headphones layer and we'll let that update. There. And then that way you can kind of add some subtle colors into your designs as well by just adding it into this add particles option. And you want to make sure that you add the, the shape layers above this layer right here. You don't want them below. And that's one important thing to take note of this. Uh, all right, so that's how you would add particles into it to color them and change the colors and the look of your final results. Now another option, and this is more advanced than the one I just showed you, is the faux depth of field. And I don't want to get too advanced in this tutorial uh, for you guys, but if you want, I did add the ability to add depth of field in with the particles. Now it's not technically native that the particles are in 3D, but I created a way that you can add 3D to your image with the particles. So let me show you what I mean by that. Uh, I, instead of using this example, I'm going to use the car example that I used in the project demo. So this is kind of a rough recreation of the demo scene that I did. And you'll notice that right now it has all the depth of field taken off of it. And it's a really subtle effect, but uh, used correctly, it can be really powerful to do a rack focus, which means you can uh, shift the depth of field from the foreground to the middle ground to the background. And how we're going to be doing this is we're going to go to the camera controller loop and we're going to enable faux depth of field. So you can see right there that we're going to check that box. And right out of the bat, it's really not going to do that much. So let's go into that faux depth of field optional layer. And what we're going to do in here is we're going to brush the main object that we want as the middle ground. So we'll go in. And you can see that this car, that's the, the middle ground object that we want to be working with. So I'm going to hit Command B for the brush, and that's going to bring up the brush tools. I'm going to double click, and then I'm just going to roughly uh, select the car. I'll make that bigger. So something like that. Okay, and then I'm going to go back to the car composition. Now you can see that it's updating right now in the corner. And I'm going to close this panel because we're not going to use the brush anymore. Now we can see that something definitely happened. If we uncheck Enable Faux Depth of Field, you can see that everything is in focus right now. But then when we check it, we can see that, okay, for one, the particles became blurry and the background kind of blurred out a little bit. So what's going on with this? Well, what's actually happening is I've set it up so that on this focus distance, you can change the duration from zero to 255, where zero will focus in on the foreground. And the foreground is the particles that are closest to you right now. Now, it's not super accurate about what particles are closest to you, but it does a pretty good job. So we can see right now that the car is out of focus and the background is out of focus, but these particles are in focus. So then we'll change the focus distance to 127, which is halfways. So the focus is on the middle ground. So now the close foreground particles are out of focus. The car and the middle ground particles where the, the particles are being emitted from is in focus and the background is out of focus. And then we change this to 255. We can see that the background is in focus, but the particles and the middle ground that we isolated are out of focus. So so this allows you to go in and create a rack focus where you can go and hit zero and then set a keyframe and then go over to like frame 200 and do 255 and hit enter. And then if you hit U, you can see that we have two keyframes set up now. And this will allow you to focus from the foreground to the background. And it's the effect that I used in the demo in case you were curious how I did that with a, with a flat object like this. The next thing I want to go over with you is the time remapping that I did for this car scene. So what I did is I actually set up for you in the assets folder the two timer maps that I did. So let me show you that. Hit command and we're going to go to our download. And within our download, we're going to go to the assets and then the time remap settings and open this After Effects project file. So let it open up and we'll double click into the time remaps layer. And now it has these two main time remap and car time remap. 
car time remap is that one in the demo I used at the very end. And main time remaps are a bunch of different ones throughout the demo that I did. And how we're gonna be replacing these is we're gonna go into, let's say the headphones, for example, and we're gonna go into render, and we're gonna be replacing these compositions with this in loop out composition. So how we're gonna do that is in the project panel, having this layer highlighted and having the layer we want to replace highlighted, we're gonna hold option on a Mac or control on a PC, click, drag and drop it on top of there. And that will enable all the exact same time remap settings that I used on there. Now, the last thing you might wanna do is, is go into this camera controller loop. And what I want you to do is disable all of these shake amounts. We don't want the camera shake on, so we'll hit zero on all of these. And then that will uh, create so there's no random jittery action that happens during the time remap. And again, this is advanced, so if you're not used to After Effects, don't worry about this. You don't have to have to do anything with the, the time remapping to get awesome results from this. But I just wanted you to have that in case you were curious how I did it and if you wanted to have it in your project. Now, the very last thing that I wanna go over in this advanced composition is to switch out the cameras. So within the headphones, composition, I remember I told you that we have these two cameras. If we switch the cameras to disable this camera loop and enable this camera, then what happens is we can actually go in and have that hit that I had in the demo. I did it to, I think, almost every single one where it came in and it pushed in right away. So with this camera setup now, if you go to the loop when you go to render, this will give you not a loop, but it will give you that push in that I use, the exact same ones in the demo. So that's how I did that. All right, that is everything for the advanced options. We just have the text options and we are all done. All right, guys, we are on the last section, the text options, and these are really simple. So let's go over them really quickly. We have uh, on the Sandstorm Motion Kit these two text options, text one and text two. Now, if you just double click them, it's gonna ask, please select a composition first. So what you wanna do is create a composition to put the text in. So we'll name this uh, Tutorial. And then for our settings, I'll just have HD 1920 by 1080 and the frame rate at 30, and looks good, 40, 450 frames is fine for the duration. I'll hit OK. Change the background color though to not being gray. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to double click on text one and it's gonna ask, uh, same as what we had for the other elements, please enter the folder name. So we'll just name this text one. And then it asks for the composition name. So we'll name this text one. So now it's gonna do its thing. Now if we twirl down this text one layer, you can see that there's two composition, insert text and text one. So this is the main text layer. So you're gonna double click into insert text and we're just gonna change this to your text, okay? And then we'll go into text one and you can see that if I disable caps that um, we have this static text and then these text layers. Now why I had this set up is that let's say for example you don't want your text to start until uh, two seconds in, so 60 frames. So we'll bring our current time indicator to 60 right here and then what I want you to do is click and drag all those bottom layers over and then slide the static text over. Now, in our main tutorial composition that we created, this text will stay up until frame 60, and then it will have that destruction happening that you saw in the demo. And that's really all there is to it. Now, one thing I did do in the demo is I had the color options on the text. So we'll go to our download and go to color options and import those, and then I'll just drag those. I'll drag the, the first one and select the collapse transform and i also had like a gradient behind there but you kind of get the idea that that's forming now the exact same shatter that i had in the demo and all you have to do is insert your text into there to have that effect and the exact same thing goes for the second text option so let's do the second text option we'll click on text two and it'll ask you oh please select a composition first so we have to highlight the composition that we want it to go in so we'll highlight this tutorial layer and double click on text 2 please name the folder so we'll name this one text 2 you can name it whatever uh, correlates to the text that you're working with and then it's going to update for just a second. This one's just a little bit more render intense than the other effect. And that's because this is kind of doing a lot of stuff in the background. Uh, right away, you can't even see the effect and that's because the sand has already fallen. So we'll go into the text and we'll go closer to like here. And you can see that this effect allows you to create this illusion that your text is 
being uh, dissolved into sand. And I was going to use this in the demo, but I ended up not using it. So if you want to use this in any of your projects, I wanted to include it in there for you. So all you have to do for this again is go to the text to option and then double click in the insert your text and then change this to whatever your text is. And then if you go back into the text to composition, you can see that that just automatically updates with your text in there. So a really cool effect with really minimal work. That is everything. If you have any questions at all, I have an FAQ page that if you just click on the description on the very top, there's a button that says FAQ. So just click on that and that should answer most questions that you have. But if not, you can always message me anytime. Just uh, message support at thomascovar.com and I'll get back to you usually within a day, usually within an hour if I'm on my computer. Thanks again, you guys. Hope you enjoy the product. Have a great day.